Hi, everybody. I thought it might be interesting to do a video on what I think are the strongest arguments against Christianity. And I'm saying this as a Christian, not just a Christian who believes that God exists, but as I argue in the appendix to my book, The Genius of the Invisible God, I actually believe that I know God exists. That is to say, I I know that God exists more than I know pretty much anything else that I can claim to know. And that's a complex argument, and it's it's a complex uh, worldview that's been developed over a, a number of years. But um, nevertheless, it's good to think about some of the objections and the arguments that can be presented against one's belief. And I've done a video in the past on uh, some of the other objections to Christianity in a PowerPoint slide, and I've been through them all. And I've also uh, made a video on the what I think are the four best arguments for design uh, and for Christianity, which I'll both of which I'll put in the in the description of this video below. But what are the strongest arguments against Christianity? that I, as a Christian, could concede are difficult. And so much so, in fact, that had I not had the experience of the Holy Spirit and Jesus as Lord and all the other experiences I've had which confirm that Christianity is the truth, they possibly would be strong enough even for someone like myself to uh, to doubt the truth and validity of, of Christianity. So I've got three. I'm going to lay them out for you. Um, one by one. Um, I think the first is perhaps the less strong of the of the three, as in terms of how much conviction I have that it's a, a massive barrier. But these are all, I think, quite strong arguments against Christianity, in that if you weren't a Christian and you were looking to explore whether the Christian faith is the truth, these, I submit, would be the strongest three barriers to your accepting it as as the truth so the first one it's what other christians believe and how they act i've said before that i think christians are perhaps the best argument for god's existence at their best but at their worst they are the best argument, or at least one of the best arguments against the Christian faith. So in part, it's to do with how Christians behave. And in part, perhaps the larger part is to do with what other Christians, what other Christians believe. And I'll lay it out like this. If you imagine an alien were to come to earth and know nothing about the human civilization and the alien picks up the religious texts that we've created reads the bible reads the other religious texts the quran etc and recognizes through the new testament particularly that jesus is lord and submits to christ and believes that the christian faith is the truth Imagine that alien hadn't met any Christians. From the reading of Scripture and what Paul says one ought to be like as a Christian and what one ought to believe and how one ought to seek the truth at all costs, the alien, when he started to, or it started to uh, engage with the human population, would expect, I think, be entitled to expect something very different in the Christian church as to what the alien would actually find. Now, we're all fallen humans, we're all sinners, so it's not so much how we behave with one another. I think that leaves a lot to be desired, and I think that when you go into a church it isn't obvious to me, apart from maybe a small proportion of every congregation one might visit, that this is a room full of people who know the creator of the universe. 
there are a lot of Christians with whom one wouldn't want to spend very much time. There are a lot of Christians who, frankly, just don't act as though they have any kind of special relationship with the divine. And perhaps more importantly, because one shouldn't be too hard on other people's behavior because you know, we've, we've all we've all had times in our life and moments, I'm sure, where we haven't done the gospel justice uh, because that's the thing where, that's the fallenness that we're saved from. But the main thing here, I think, is how unwilling Christians are to take the injunction to seek the truth and believe truthful things at all costs. That's repeated throughout Scripture. And frankly, almost no Christian that you'll meet, very, very few, act and live and think as though that's a very, very important way to orient yourselves in the world, in a relationship with Christ. And that is, a, to me, a huge barrier and it took me, it, so, who has obviously many faults, but I one of the things I would say about myself is I do passionately love and seek the truth at all times, at all costs. It's one of my my main passions and desires in life. And frankly, most Christians you'll meet aren't like that. And it's difficult to know why. I mean, you can start to break it down and and come to an understanding about why that might be but there's no question that if you look if you took a, a sort of broad brush look at the the christians you're likely to meet in all different countries you are going to find that they believe absurd things things that are not just counterfactual or untrue but that actively cause damage to the faith's credibility to its reputation and it's difficult from the outside to look at that and think, yeah, these guys look like they know the creator of the universe. I really want to be part of that. And I think if the alien were to look at the human population from an outsider's perspective after reading the the the, the New Testament, particularly, and, and becoming uh, a Christian itself, I think its perception of what the church is going to be like compared to what it finds it's actually like has a huge ethical and conceptual and intellectual discontinuity. And I think that is one of the main reasons why not just so many people aren't Christian, but that they are brought up in Christian churches and households, and when they get to their teens and 20s, leave the church in their droves because of many of the ludicrous things that the church is teaching, its attitude towards certain things in society. And I'm I'm being cautious not to name any particular types of um, belief here, but you're going to get the gist of what I mean, I think. So, yeah, I think that's that's the number one not um, the strongest, perhaps, but it's my number one in terms of order of um, play here. So that's the first one. It's what other Christians believe and how they act and how they don't have the kind of regard for the truth that one would expect, especially given that a love for the truth and a and a, and a, and a, a an honest and genuine search for the truth would set them free in so many ways that they can't imagine and, and just exhilarate and bless their lives more than they can possibly imagine. Number two, this is another tough one. And I wrote about this in my book. And at the end, I'll I'll try to have a, a brief, um, a very brief answer to these, but I think they're, they're going to take way more unpacking than I can do justice in this video. Number two is... It's the it's the fact that for most of evolution's history, several billion years and certainly 
tens of millions for creatures that are able to suffer and feel pain, including humans in the last sort of 200,000 years. For the vast, vast majority of our evolutionary history, it would seem that God hasn't played any active part in mitigating their pain and suffering and in many cases having an active uh, presence and inviting a relationship with himself now that's obviously a complex line of thought in itself because superficially at least on the surface what it seems to us is that for hundreds of thousands of years Nothing much has happened in terms of God's interaction with humans. And then three, four thousand years ago, God starts to communicate with human beings, uh, which is documented in the New, in the uh, Old Testament. And we start to get codified laws and we start to get an understanding of, of who he is. Now, I don't know and we don't know what sort of relationship God had with the what you might call the proto-humans, the other the other um, primates. It's too complex for us to know. Maybe he had none. Maybe there, there, there are so many things we just don't understand about that. But there's no question that, as far as I can tell, there has been an awful lot of subsistence-level living, struggles against nature, suffering, premature death, when, as far as we know, there hasn't been any indication along that long trajectory of timeline that God is our creator, that he's present in the lives of, of people. And even if, even if there is some kind of relationship between God in a spiritual sense and the sort of proto-humans, that probably went on for maybe a couple of hundred thousand years, as far as we can tell from our evolutionary legacy, it still doesn't quite explain why the animal kingdom is subjected to such a brutal struggle for survival, for predation, and gruesome deaths, as Tennyson said, nature red in tooth and claw, um, animals are, are often left to freeze to death or to drown or to be dehydrated or to starve to death. Um, the way other animals kill them, uh, their predators are, it's often very, very gruesome and it doesn't happen very quickly. It can take hours sometimes of suffering and death. Even the quicker deaths sometimes can be several, you know, minutes of intense pain. And there's a lot of that, an awful lot of that in the Earth's history before there's any kind of seemingly um, contactable presence between creation and God. Now, as I said, there's probably a lot we don't know about that, but if one were to come uh, and say, yeah, that's... Uh, that's a pretty big barrier for me. I just can't reconcile that with an all-loving, all-powerful God. Then, to be fair, it's a it's a reasonable proposition, and it does take a lot of a lot of consideration, a lot of contemplation. Now, as I said, I I know God exists, and I know because of my experiences and the, the experience I have of others. But so. These aren't going to be uh, arguments that are going to dissuade me from belief because I have the Holy Spirit, but they're definitely worth considering, I think. And the third one, the third one is going to take a bit of unpacking too. It's it's to do with the notion of we will. Now, I've written a lot about this in in the book as well, and I it, it's too too long and in depth to try and justify and answer it now. But I'll tell you at the very least what I think is the third strongest argument against Christianity, 
And maybe for some with a philosophical bent, it's possibly even the strongest. So if you take free will to mean the ability to make choices in a way that could have been other choices, as a simple definition, because it's important to define our terms. If you think about it, there are, there are only two types of decision you can make in life. A decision based on your to, uh, desire to do something or a decision based on being forced to do something. If you're not sure about that, just pause the video and think about that. Every single decision you make falls into one of those categories. You are you either desired to do it or you were forced to do it against your natural desire. Your desire to do something means you wanted to do it because it, you still preferred to do it when considered against all other alternatives. Now, to avoid a possible misunderstanding here, your desire to do something doesn't just mean doing the things that you actively enjoy doing and you're glad you're doing that's not quite how it works you know you might say for example um i had my covid vaccine but i didn't really desire to do it i i hate needles i don't like the pain of needles and the after effects of the vaccine but i felt compelled to do it to protect myself and others from covid but that doesn't mean you didn't desire to do it you still weighed up the other options and decided that having the vaccine was the decision that provided the preferred utility amongst competing preferences. You may not have enjoyed your vaccine, and you may wish you lived in a world where you didn't need a COVID vaccine, but in having it, when no one forced you to have it, you desired to have it. And that's how economics uh, presents arguments in terms of costs and benefits and and uh, reveal preferences too. When you do something you wouldn't ordinarily choose to do with enthusiasm, it's still because your desire to do it is stronger than competing desires because the benefits to you outweighed the costs. So having hopefully now convinced you that every decision is either something you desire or something you are forced to do, an argument can be put forward to suggest that this means we don't have free will. And the reasoning goes something like this, that if you're forced to do something then that you didn't desire, then that isn't free will. But if you did desire it, that isn't free will either, because we don't control or choose what we desire. So suppose one evening I fancy watching, I don't know, either... Uh, Asia or Seinfeld, and I can't choose which I prefer. I desire one of those two, but I didn't control my desire to narrow it down to those two options. Things happened in my internal machinery to lead me to that decision to desire those two. And suppose I think about it for another couple of minutes, and then I opt for Frasier. I did so because my desire for Frasier was slightly stronger and greater than my desire for Seinfeld. But I can't choose to desire Frasier more than Seinfeld. It occurred within my internal cognition with causes that way predate the immediacy of that decision. You know, we can't, we can't control any of our desires, it seems, not ultimately. They happen to us within our subconscious based on all our experiences over a lifetime, really. It's... And to, to to demonstrate that further, you know, think of something that you don't desire right now. You know, you probably don't desire that you'll fall over and break your pelvis this evening. Now, if you tried your hardest to desire it, to convince yourself that you desire it, you still wouldn't be able to desire that. And that shows that we don't choose our desires. They're stronger than us and they come upon us. So you may be thinking, hang on a minute. Suppose I had a slight preference for Frasier, but I chose to override that desire and watch Seinfeld instead. Doesn't that demonstrate that I have free will, the free will to override my desire? Well, no, it doesn't actually. Because all it shows is that your desire to demonstrate your belief 
in Free Will and watch Seinfeld was stronger than your desire to watch Fraser, you still didn't choose or have any control over that desire. We can't change something we desire into something we don't desire, or vice versa, without desiring to change the desire. You know, at any point, the desire comes upon us. We don't come upon it, in a sense. Now, that's perhaps the most persuasive argument against free will that one could make. We either do things we're forced to do, in which case it's not free will, or we do something we desire to do, but we can't control our desires, in which case it's not free will either. And therefore, if we don't have free will, then how can Christianity make sense, given that it's predicated on our being sinners who must freely cho choose to repent and accept the price that Jesus paid for our forgiveness on the cross? How can God punish us for not repenting if we have no desire to repent and no control over our desire to repent or our desire to desire to repent? You know, taken at face value, it seems to put us in an unenviable position in a sense because that potentially undermines the framework of Christianity. Now, that argument in itself as well made as it appears to be, doesn't actually convince me because it doesn't seem to be speaking about the reality we know and experience. Even if we don't fully understand all the conditions and causes for our decisions and our desires and our will, we still live as though we have the ability to make choices in a way in which we could have made different choices. Now, it's probably a good time to stop there. So otherwise it will just go on for hours because I've unpacked all of these three objections and arguments against Christianity in my in my book, The Genius of the Invisible God. But so let's stop for now. But have a think about those. And if you have any comments, any any thoughts, then please do leave them in the in the comments below. If you have any other objections you consider equally strong, um, as a Christian particularly, would be interesting. But yeah, just have a have a think about those three because I think they are, after a lot of thought, they are, they are the three strongest arguments that I can come up with against Christianity. Not conclusive because I, I I know God exists, but yeah, I think those are the those are the three, and. I think it's a good exercise as Christians to test ourselves and to, to think about possible reasons why the Christian faith could be argued against or could be objected to. And uh, yeah, I think it makes for a healthy mind. So hopefully that was interesting. And thank you for thank you for watching. And please do like and particularly subscribe if you want to see more videos. And I will put some uh, links in the description. Thank you very much.